big spring morning to each one of you out there today. Welcome to a few minutes of fellowship here in the Lord with Miss Ann and myself, David Johnson, at the little studio in Wilkes County, North Carolina. We're hoping and praying that the uh, broadcast this morning finds you ready for whatever plans that the Lord has for you today and that you'll feel His presence in your life today and every day. As we start our morning time here, we also want to invite you to our morning worship service, as we always do, over at Arbor Grove United Methodist Church in Perlier, North Carolina. That service will start live at 10 o'clock this morning on the Facebook page of the same name, Arbor Grove United Methodist Church. That's A-R-B-O-R. -R. Somebody asked how to spell it a while back. Arbor Grove United Methodist Church. And the broadcast will also be available on the Arbor Grove site in the archives after today as well. And if you would uh, like to join us at the Arbor the, in person, we'd love to have you there. We've got room for you. Just please feel free to be there. Our address is 1984 Arbor Grove Church Road, Perlier, North Carolina. And Pastor Susan Pillsbury Taylor is going to be on hand this morning with a great message from Romans chapter 8. And we'll have a seat ready just for you if you want to come by. But join us online if you can't, and we'll have a big time in the Lord. Now, last week we spent a few minutes looking at the miraculous nature of God's Word, and in particular the similarities between the lives and the events concerning Abraham's son, Isaac, way back in the Old Testament, and the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. There's several things like that in the Bible. This is just one of those instances. Uh, the parallels and the connections from lives and events over hundreds and even thousands of years in Scripture always fill me with respect and confirmation about how wonderful and how all-powerful our God really is. You know, he made the universe, uh, both the parts that we've seen and explored, and the other parts that we don't even know about yet. And his word is just as miraculous as he is. It's all part of him. As a matter of fact, if you go read the first uh, part of the Gospel of John, the word and Jesus are categorized as the same thing. And God's son Jesus is the most wonderful miracle of all for me because he's responsible for us having a chance at eternal life and fellowship with God, even though we're sinners and we're all unworthy. So with that in mind, we want to dig a little deeper into Scripture this week and look at other similarities between Isaac and Jesus. But let us review for a minute. Uh, now, last week we found these four things in Scripture, and I want to remind us of them. The first thing we found is that both Isaac's birth in the Old Testament and Jesus' birth were miraculous and unlikely because of their earthly parents. Isaac's father, Abram, and his mother, Sarai, uh, were physically too old to have children. And they were just past the normal childbearing years. But that didn't stop God from enabling them to get pregnant and have Isaac. And Mary and Joseph weren't even married yet. They had not even had a, they hadn't had a sexual relationship. And, uh, but God caused Mary to become pregnant with Jesus, even though she was a virgin and convinced Joseph, her fiancé, to accept that situation, which is a miracle in itself. How many men would accept that, that the woman they're going to marry has turned up pregnant even before they're married, uh, and not by him? God convinced Joseph, her fiancé, to accept that situation in a dream. And so they became legitimately married, and we know the Christmas story, this unlikely couple, had the baby Jesus. Uh, now, the next thing we looked at last week was both Isaac and Jesus' births were foretold in prophecy. Genesis chapter 12, God tells Abraham he's going to be the father of a great nation by his own offspring. 
And even before that, in Genesis 3, God tells Satan that Eve, the mother of all living, will have a descendant that will defeat Satan himself. He's talking about Jesus there. And the third thing that we looked at last week, if you remember, Isaac in the Old Testament, uh, back in Genesis 22, was the only son of Abraham and Sarah. The only son of those two. Abraham other son, had another son, but Abraham and Sarah only had one. Jesus, in the New Testament, in John 3.16, is referred to as the only begotten Son of God. They were both only children. And finally, last week, we looked at Genesis 17, uh, verse 19. Isaac was named before he was born. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Jesus is named before he is born. Same kind of situation going on here. Now, we found those four things in Scripture last week. Let's look at a few more today because there's several. Our fifth thing that we're going to look at, there was going to be a sacrifice, a special sacrifice. And this was going to be more meaningful than any sacrifice that had ever been done in the uh, history of mankind, the history of our world. And both fathers knew that the sacrifice was going to take place. And why? Both Abraham, who was the father of Isaac, and God, the father of Jesus, were willing to sacrifice their only son. And each father of each boy loved his only son. You see young couples out here and they get married and they have one little baby and boy, I'll tell you that baby a lot of times gets spoiled because it's their only child. Well, Abraham and God, and God both loved their only son and they were still willing to sacrifice their son. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son because he loved God and God was going to tell him to sacrifice his son. And in faith, Abraham was willing to do that. God loved his only son, but he loved the human race so much that he was willing to sacrifice his son for us because we were sinners and had been since the Garden of Eden. And that's what he was talking about whenever he told Satan, he said, you're going to have trouble because of, one of, because of Eve's uh, descendant that's going to be born. The sixth thing that we're going to look at in uh, these parallels, Abraham and Isaac went to the place of sacrifice. And if you look in Genesis 22, where this story is, they took companions with them. They took a donkey and they took companions uh, but they would have to leave those companions. They'd have to be separated from those companions to go to the actual place of sacrifice where Abraham knew that he was going to sacrifice his son. And if you'll remember, there was a donkey in the story of Jesus. Jesus rode into Jerusalem about a week before he was sacrificed on the cross. And he rode on a donkey. He went in with his companions like Abraham and Isaac went in. But they would eventually be separated. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But there was a prophecy here. And if you look closely, you'll see it. That both boys, are go both men are going to return from the place of sacrifice. Now, ordinarily, you think of sacrifice as being a final thing. Uh, yeah, you, the sacrifice is killed. Well, Abraham told their two companions in Genesis 22 that he and Isaac were going to sacrifice over here on the mountaintop, but that they would return to them after this time of worship. That's what the sacrifice was, was a time of worship. And he and Isaac would return as soon as they got done with this worship time. 
This meant that Abraham believed that Isaac would return alive. Either that or he is the world's greatest liar, and I just don't think Abraham was. It was a preview of resurrection. It's so easy to look at it like that. You go to Genesis chapter 22 and you read that today. That story, it's all right there. Now, this meant that Isaac believed that Abraham believed that Isaac would return alive. Well, as Jesus told his companions, his disciples, in John 14, and if you've ever sat through a funeral service, you've heard this scripture that he was going to go to a place where they could not go. Just like Abraham and Isaac, centuries before, were going to a place of sacrifice where their companions couldn't go. But Jesus said he would prepare a place for them and he would return to them. Just like Abraham said he and Isaac would return to their companions. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And it turned out it wasn't just for them. It was for the whole world if the world wanted to go. But I'll come back. And I'll come back and get you, as a matter of fact. And that's a promise in itself. We're going to have a, going to have a lesson on that one day. And on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, they were separated that very next day. And they left him. They ran off. They were scared. And he went to the place of sacrifice without his companions. He went alone. The last one we'll look at today is a, a seventh in our line. We're going to keep up with how many there are, and there may be more that we haven't looked at because we're going to stay with this theme through, uh, through Easter Sunday. The seventh parallel we're going to find between Isaac and Jesus is that both of them, ask questions and talked with their fathers about the sacrifice. In Genesis 22, back in the Old Testament, Isaac was concerned about where they would get the sacrifice. They had taken wood, and we're going to talk about that wood next week. They took wood, they took all the provisions. Uh, to, as a matter of fact, Isaac had to wind up carrying it, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, but Isaac was looking around and they didn't have a lamb for the sacrifice. And he was concerned about it. And if you look at it in the old King James Bible, uh, there's even an exclamation point at the end of the thing when he says, Father, where are we going to get a sacrifice? We've got the wood. We've got the place. We're here. He was concerned. He was questioning about it. And in Matthew 26, 29, Jesus is praying to his father. It's just minutes or maybe an hour or so before the crowd come to get him, to take him to be tried and to be crucified. And Jesus fell on his face in Matthew 26 and prayed just before his sacrifice on the cross. And he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, is there not some way we could get around this and do it another way? He didn't want to suffer those things. He was a human. But then he said those words that made him Jesus. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. To me, these pictures of Isaac and Jesus, separated by many centuries of time, show the timeless purpose of God. He's always had the plan. He always knew what was coming down. And these scriptures show in both men the willingness, their willingness, to go on with God's plan, even though they didn't want to, or they were concerned about it, or in Isaac's case, they didn't understand all of it. He didn't know where the sacrifice was coming from, even at the last minute there. Isaac and Jesus both were willing to be obedient to their father. There was a love. There was a trust. And Jesus said, whatever you want is what I'll do. So let me ask you folks, do you know God in this way? Can you say that to God? Whatever you want me to do, show me. Help me do it, and I'll try to do it. 
You know, sometimes it's hard to know if God's speaking to us in our lives when we're driven a certain direction. Sometimes I'm afraid it's just old Dave trying to say something to myself, pushing me in a certain way. Or it might be old Satan coming at us from another way. But the only way we'll know for sure if it's the Lord is to love him and to trust him. The main thing that he asks us to do is to have faith in his only begotten son and to invite him to live in our heart and be our guide in eternity. We're all eligible for this reward because it's a gift from the Father above who sacrificed his only son so that we could be forgiven of our sins because we're all sinners. We're born that way. But if we confess our sins to God and we repent and say that we want to change and be forgiven by having faith in Jesus and his sacrifice, then we can have that eternal life that he speaks about. And when the books are opened in the last days that are talked about in Revelation and other books, our name will be in the book of life. And that's the only way we get to eternal life is faith in Christ. It's a promise that's made by the Lord who made all these miraculous things we've been talking about happen in history. And he's still making things happen. He makes them happen in your life too. Don't give up. If things get rough, don't lose heart. Life can be rough sometimes. Just believe in Jesus and keep on reading the Word if you're lucky enough to have access to the Word. And keep on praying. In a shaky world and shaky times, Jesus is our rock and He won't move. Amen. I heard the Florida boys do this song one time. It's one of my favorite gospel songs. Speaking about rocks, it goes like this. <laughs> Disappointment, strife and discontentment I cast my every care upon the Lord No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression I'm standing on the solid rock I'm standing on the rock of ages Safe from every storm that rages but not from Satan's wages, standing on the solid rock. Even though he's gone now, I don't feel alone now. With comfort came the Spirit of the Lord. Now with his word to guide me, from temptations hide me. I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages, safe from every storm that rages, rich but not from Satan's wages, standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the solid Folks, you get on the rock too, okay? I hope to see you next week. Take care. I love you. Bye-bye.